What's happening, everybody? It's Sean with Reactions to the Classics, and today we got a top 10 of Jimmy Webb, brought to you by a friend, longtime supporter and patron of the channel, Ancat Dub. Thank you, Ancat Dub. Appreciate you. Appreciate all the patrons who make this thing go. If you'd like to support us anyway, check out that Patreon link below or the patron link on the end screen. I don't really know anything at all about Jimmy Webb, but Ancat Dub, along with a couple of our other patrons, are always very educational in music that I don't know that I should know. So Ancat Dub says, this playlist features various artists performing exceptional versions of Jimmy Webb's songs. A few of those recordings were the original releases, but not all. Webb himself sings three of the tracks. The songs are arranged in chronological order by recording date and not meant to represent a progression towards best song. Just keep that in mind. I personally prefer some of Webb's more obscure songs to the known hits, but I'm not going to impose that on anyone. So a little background on Jimmy. In the mid-1960s, Jimmy Webb sought work in, in the Hollywood music scene while he was still a teenager. Weirdly and somewhat unexpectedly, he was first hired by the publishing arm of Motown Records. I say weirdly because few of the songs could be described as R&B in style in their arrangement. While at Motown, he, first, he achieved his first commercial recording with My Christmas Tree by The Supremes in 1965. At that point, Webb had not really developed a signature style. He was mainly trying to write radio-friendly tunes that might generate some income. A noble cause, right? Fortunately for Webb, he was soon introduced to the singer-songwriter-producer Johnny Rivers, who would begin using Webb songs on his own album project before con contracting Webb to be the in-house composer and arranger at Rivers' new Soul City Records label. In 1967, Rivers recorded his Rewind album which included seven web tunes, an extraordinary vote of confidence for a mostly unknown fledgling songwriter, for sure, man. That same year, Rivers hired his first act to the new label, a vocal harmony group calling themselves The Fifth Dimension. For The Fifth Dimension's debut album, Webb contributed five songs, including, of course, the classic Up, Up, and Away, which would also be released as a single, peaking at number seven on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. It would also be awarded Song of the Year at the Grammys. During this time with Johnny Rivers and Soul City Records, Webb began to develop a composition and lyric style that was more true to his own personality and vision, rather than continuing to rely upon current music industry tropes. Note that three or four of these Fifth Dimension Jimmy Webb tracks can be heard in the Fifth Dimension Artist Spotlights that I reacted to back in 2023. I'm going to put both of the links to those videos down below. Watch them, of course, after this. Webb wasn't happy for long working as a contract composer. He had dreams of becoming a rock star like seemingly everyone else in 1960s Los Angeles. I always thought, you know, you think back on these times, like he could be anything. The rock music and the popular music was really just kicking off, right? A teenager could go and try to be someone. Just, that would have been a cool time to be in. He was eventually able to get out of his contract with Rivers and create his own publishing and production company, the short-lived Canopy Productions. Webb did score a major success right off the bat for Canopy, recorded an album with the Irish actor-singer Richard Harris named A Tramp Shining. Webb provided all the songs for the project, as well as arrangements and production. The single from the album, MacArthur Park, became one of the most unexpected hits of the decade, peaking at number two on the Billboard Hot 100. At seven minutes and 21 seconds in length, uh, Ancat Dub says, I personally find the track campy, overwrought, and overblown, but it is a favorite of many. I've added it to the Jimmy Webb bonus tracks playlist on Spotify, so check it out if you dare. That bonus track of Jimmy Webb, songs that didn't make it on here, are in a link down below in a nice Spotify playlist just greatly done by Ancat Dub. By the early 1970s, Webb was trying to realize his dream of becoming a major singer-songwriter by recording albums of his own material. Music critics tended to give him glowing reviews, but the public never seemed to fall for Webb's performance style. His voice is distinctly American, but an acquired taste for many. As the 70s wore on, the production values on Webb's albums seemed to improve steadily. 1974's Land In album was performed with the help of Joni Mitchell, Ringo Starr, and Nigel Olsen, which of course was Elton John's star drummer. Webb's 1977 album, El Mirage, was produced and arranged by the one and only George Martin, one of Webb's industry heroes. However, as the 1980s approached, both the production and composition styles tended to so sound solidly adult contemporary rather than mainstream rock or even a hip version of the current pop styles. Stylistically, I prefer the albums from the early 70s to anything Webb was creating by 1980. So before we jump into this list, the music will not be in the video, but it will be at a Vimeo link below. So click on that and follow along. And uh, we're going to have a couple bonus tracks. So this is a this is really a top 12, but top 10 is the series, right? So I called it a top 10. Let's get to the first one. And I'll remind you as we jump in here one more time, this is chronologically, not an order of 12 to 1. Which Way to Know We're recorded in 1967 by the Fifth Dimension. We got Billy Davis on lead vocals here. And Cat Dub says, in the mid-60s, Webb was composing a number of what I call commercial jingles, simple compositions with a repeated hook, 
and relatively little variation in their musical structure, naturally intended to be radio friendly. In my opinion, most of these don't sound very inspired and are sometimes annoying in the repetitions of predictability. It wasn't until Webb had signed on with Johnny Rivers they began writing lyrics and music that could be considered authentic and unique to Jimmy Webb. Which Way to Nowhere, recorded in 1967 by the Fifth Dimension for their debut album, Up, Up, and Away, is a good representation of Webb transitioning from predictable ditties to the more authentic Webb themes of loss, rejection, and regret, often involving unconventional characters out of step with the surrounding society. That may not sound very fun, but Webb had a unique way of charming the listener while tugging at the heartstrings. This track is certainly catchy and radio-friendly, with wonderful sonics, but the lovesick, brooding lyrics are pure Jimmy Webb, and Webb's arrangement shows a real attention to quirky details that would become a hallmark of his composition style. Also check out the track Never Gonna Be The Same from the same album, which is going to be on that bonus tracks playlist, as it has a similar energy, but sung from the female point of view. All right, I'm going to have the lyrics up as always. Thanks again, and Cat Dub. Which way to know where you felt the pain in Billy Davis's voice, right? You felt it. And that arrangement was fantastic. Like all of it, the harmonies uh, in the bridge, you know, the female voices come in to sing some of it. But I mean, the story is, and it, it is just a story of heartbreak. Well, after this morning, I couldn't bear for her to share love with someone new. When I told her I was leaving, she just laughed and said, now, where will you go to? And now I don't know what to do. And then the course, which way to know where that's all I really need to know. Which way to nowhere when you've got nowhere to go. So he's got nowhere to go. And he's got a, he talks about he has a car, a brand new car. He's on the highway. He's got a map, but he doesn't know where to turn. And then that bridge, I had no choice but to believe her. I never thought that I would leave her. She said she loved me. How was I to know I would wind up on this road with nowhere to go? And then just the way the orchestration comes in and the different harms. Like, that's a fantastic song to kick this thing off. And we're going to stay right where we are we got, I think it's called, I think it's Rosecrans Boulevard. I couldn't find anywhere where it was would tell me what it said. 1967 from the Fifth Dimension, Billy Davis on lead vocals. It was recorded for the Fifth Dimension's second album, The Magic Gardens. And it is a it is a our typical Jimmy Webb tune. Like a lot of country music, it's a song of regret and misgivings. But the lyrics and musical arrangement have a strong 1960s Los Angeles atmosphere. Like the previous track, it's very much a road song. It reminds me of the point in so many Broadway musicals where the stage darkens and a single spot illuminates one actor who begins singing a sad confessional song about an old love. Many of the Jimmy Webb songs tend to have something a bit surreal to them, either in the lyrics and or the orchestrations. A story is conjured up, but one can never be certain of the details. Webb knew how to be evocative without getting pinned down by too many specifics. This song is a bit like that. It contains one of Webb's more memorable lines. She was a stewardess, you know, shot down on a non-combatant mission. That's a great line right there. During the Vietnam era, Pan Am Airlines did ferry U.S. military personnel back and forth to Saigon, but I don't know of any planes actually being shot down, although there were some close calls, and can't Dub says. This may just be what, what Webb created a metaphor out of topical material. But again, he leaves enough unsaid to let the imagination roam. This one again is sung by Billy Davis. And I give the fifth dimension much credit for the willingness to include this kind of web oddity in their discography. Most people of the day felt a black vocal group had no business recording this type of music as it didn't fit neatly into approved categories such as R&B, blues, or jazz. But by 1975, the fifth dimension had recorded approximately 24 Jimmy Webb tracks, which has to be something of a record. If you like this recording, also check out the one titled Requiem, Requiem 820 Latham from the Magic Gardens album that can be found on the Jimmy Webb bonus tracks list below. All right, really good production and really interesting when you're listening through headphones because the first part of the song, the first verse is in my left ear, right in the left channel. And the second verse switches to my right channel and then it's then it's in both. But it, it's interesting written around, you know, basically he's saying that uh, he didn't care about her anyway, but he really did, right? And he kind of shattered her. Like she fell in love with him. That's what I think. And he went ahead and crashed her. That's, I think, the analogy he's using in the stewardess thing, that he's the one that did it. I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I broke her heart, right? And I think he's looking back on it in regret. That's just my two cents from the first time here, and you might have a better take. Next up, we have Do What You Gotta Do from the great Nina Simone in 1968. And Cat Dub says, Do What You Gotta Do was first recorded in 1967 by Johnny Rivers for his Rewind album. Both Nina Simone and Al Wilson recorded the song a year later. I feel Simone's rendition is the classic version, so that's the one we'll listen to here. The Rivers version sounds more like a country love ballad, but this is a song that can be all things to all people. Listening to Simone, one would never guess that this was anything other than a soul number. 
Do What You Gotta Do is a much recorded song by a wide range of artists, including Linda Ronstadt, The Four Tops, Roberta Flack, Paul Anka, and Ronnie Millsap. All right. Wow. That song was great, man. That song was great. You know, basically Nina's telling this guy, I know you're leaving me to go out in the world and do whatever it is you think you got to do, but I knew it from the start. And my eyes wide open in verse two, it gets in the way. Basically, other people are going to make this guy feel bad. What they don't understand is she had her eyes open from the start, but she's still going to be here for him. So she says, come back and visit him when she can. But you just feel it in the, I, the, the production of it is fantastic. It, you know, Ancat Dub's definitely right so far away. The production and the arrangement on these are just top notch, but that song was really good. Next up, we got Wichita Lyman from 1968 by the great Glenn Campbell. Ancat Dub says, much has been written about Wichita Lyman, perhaps Jimmy Webb's most iconic song. Having had a hit with Webb's By the Time I Get to Phoenix, Glenn Campbell had specifically requested that Webb write him another song about an actual place. Webb considered Mitch at Wichita Lyman to be unfinished when he presented it to Campbell, but the singer had the inspiration to simply repeat the melody line on Carol Kay's Dano bass guitar with lots of tremolo added, rather than wait for Webb to devise a last verse and finale. I found this went to number three on the Billboard charts. I know this song's famous. I don't know if I know it. Like I was born in 1970. I just don't know if I've ever heard it. I don't know much Glenn Campbell, but what I do know is I just love it, man. I love Glenn Campbell, man. He just seemed like a great dude. All right, Wichita Lineman, Glenn Campbell. What a great song. I've never heard that song. So well done. Like the, the arrangement's so interesting. It's not country. It's not rock. It's just somewhere in this world in between, right? And I guess maybe that's part of the beauty of it. But, you know, it's just the story of this Wichita Lineman, a phone guy. When the phone lines used to be so important, I mean, now it seems insane, right? Because no one even has a landline hardly, but it used to be everything, I mean, before the cell phones came along. So Jimmy actually said he was driving in northern Oklahoma, close enough to Wichita, Kansas. I mean, Wichita, Kansas is north of that, so close enough. Uh, and uh, he saw a lineman up on that phone pole, right, up there talking on a phone because they would splice in when they're fixing the phone line. So he just kind of came up with a story and imagine what this guy's life would be like writing kind of to it, thinking about and writing to somebody that he loves. So that's how he came up with this, but just so well done. Like the arrangement's great. Glenn sounds fantastic. Huh? I wish, I wish there's more Glenn Campbell on here. Is there? I don't know. Is that a tease? I don't know. But next up we have worst that could happen by the Brooklyn bridge. Although you'll see on there, it says now on, on Spotify, Johnny Meister on the Brooklyn bridge, it's Brooklyn bridge. Uh, and Cat Dub says, Worst That Could Happen was originally recorded by the Fifth Dimension for their second album, The Magic Garden, which we referenced earlier, right? However, most people know the version recorded by the lesser known Brooklyn Bridge Group that peaked at number three on Hot 100 in 1969. It's a rougher, more stripped down version than the arrangement Webb had created for the Fifth Dimension. But singer Johnny Maestro's vocals really work well on this tune, and the organ seems the perfect accompaniment for a song referring to a wedding. Yeah, you got that right. All right, The Worst That Could Happen. Really well done, right? Great orchestration. Johnny Maestro, man, you feel it in his voice too, right? Just like you did on the first Fifth Dimension track. Like, he basically finds out this girl he cares about and he's been with is uh, getting married. And he said, that's the best thing that could happen for her, but it's the worst thing that could happen to Johnny. But he says he can't get married. That's not his thing. And this this girl, he knows she deserves a house, you know, and to be married and, and those things that she wants. But uh it's still the worst thing that could happen to him. But he's saying he can't get married. He says that at the very end. I'm never going to get married. No, no. So an interesting dichotomy there. I don't want you to get married, but I don't want to marry you. But uh, there's a lot of people that way, but really well done. I'm surprised. We got Glenn back. And I knew he's coming back. Galveston, recorded in November 1968 and January 1969 by the great Glenn Campbell. And Cat Deb says, Galveston is recorded by Glenn Campbell and backed by the Wrecking Crew musicians. Went to number four on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and number one on both the country and easy listening charts. Now, just think about that. I mean, this happened a little more back during this time, but still four on the Hot 100, one on the country, one on the easy listening, three different kinds of genres. That's hard to blend the same song into. So that's fantastic. The song has an obvious wartime theme, as explained by Jimmy Webb. The song is, quote, about a guy who got caught up in something he just doesn't understand and would rather be somewhere else. It's just that simple. Webb's own recorded version is much slower and more morose, but I think Campbell's up-tempo version is clever. It hooks the listener in before revealing its sad story. After the song's chart success, Jimmy was invited to the Galveston Shrimp Festival and Parade in 1969 to serve as Grand Marshal. Webb and the unfortunate Miss Shrimp Festival, who happened to be sitting beside him in the parade catalog, were pelted with shrimp to shouts of go back where you came from, sissy, and much more. And Cat Dove says it was the glamorous life of a pop songwriter. 
So um, obviously this song is about Vietnam. We did some other research on it. And so I guess the people who, you know, were pro-war did this to, uh, to Jimmy. And that was 1969. I can tell you in 2024 as I'm filming this, the same thing would probably happen in the United States of America. That's, that's how far we've evolved or haven't. Galveston, I just wanted that thing to go on longer. Just so well done, right? It doesn't have to be overtly about the war, right? It is, but it doesn't have to come out and say it. But he's just talking. He, he, she was 21, so he's probably in that age range too, right? And he's leaving her Galveston. He just really would rather be there with her. And he said, Galveston, oh, Galveston University, I still hear your sea waves crashing. While I watch the cannons flashing, I clean my gun and dream of Galveston. Galveston, oh Galveston, I'm so afraid of dying. Before I dry the tears, she's crying. Before I watch your seabirds flying in the sun. Hey, Galveston, oh Galveston. And I found that the original lyrics actually had another couple lines in here. Uh, Wonder if she could forget me. I'd go home if they would let me. Put down this gun and go to Galveston. That was heard on the original Don Ho version of all people. But man, all these songs have been good. But the two Glenn ones have just been fantastic. All right, we're halfway done with Jimmy Webb's top 12. Uh, according to Ann Cat Dub, remember again the chronological order. So the next three songs we have, I'll just give it away a little bit, are all going to be from Jimmy himself. We got P.F. Sloan, recorded in 1970. Ann Cat Dub says it's time to hear from the man himself, Jimmy Webb. His dream was to become a successful singer songwriter and follow in the footsteps of his heroes, such as Joni Mitchell, James Taylor, and Jackson Brown. Webb eventually began recording his own material in the early 70s, but struggled to gain a large audience for his idiosyncratic performance style. This track, in my opinion, is one of his most endearing efforts. This arrangement is a perfect fit for the subject matter. Nothing overproduced or cluttered about this track. Note that P.F. Sloan, the man who was a member of the Wrecking Crew during the 60s, an example of Sloan's session work would be the intro guitar part on the Mamas and the Papas' California Dreaming. I mean, that's iconic. He also created the famous guitar riff for Secret Agent Man, co-written by Sloan and Steve Barry, and a hit for Johnny Rogers. And he was a successful songwriter as well as a musician, and the folk singer Barry McGuire had a number one hit with Sloan's Eve of Destruction in 1965, a song that until a few years ago I'd never heard of, and now is a top 50 most watched reaction on our channel. We have a reaction to that up, and top 50 is pretty rarefied error because we got over 2,600 vids up. So, wow, very talented guy, multifaceted. All right, P.S. Sloan. I can see how Jimmy's vocal can take a while to get used to. I actually don't mind it. I really don't mind it at all. At first, the first verse, I'm like, he kind of sounds like he's trying to go in hard like Van Morrison, and then he just kind of gets off into his own style. I don't even know how to for, like really describe it, but I mean, I thought it was thought it was good. I thought he really did a good job writing the song. You know, no, 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 no. Don't sing this song. No, just don't sing this song. It belongs to P.F. Sloan. So the first verse, he's talking about P.F. Sloan. As P.F. Sloan was really popular in the '60s, I talked about. And then he just kind of disappeared and could never really do anything in the music industry again. But then verse two, it's about my old friend Trigger up and died. Now they got him stuffed. That was Roy Rogers' horse and some famous cowboy westerns, and they actually did stuff Trigger. And then the second part of the verse of London Bridge was finally found. They moved it to another town, and now all the people gather around to watch the bridge fall down. But I don't think it will be no more. Oh, no. Now I'll listen to him singing, and then we get that P.F. Sloan. But it's the kind of things that were once popular or people knew and then have kind of went away. I think that's kind of the underlying theme there. And then it gets a little Nixon barb in verse three. And I read that all the Nixon supporters stopped buying his records then because, you know, like whatever, man. Um, that definitely wouldn't have changed nowadays. But a, uh, a really well done song. But let's keep on that Jimmy Webb vocal. We got High Pockets recorded in 1971. I haven't been able to find confirmation, Ann Cat Dub says, but I believe Webb is using the nickname High Pockets to refer to his younger self. He grew up mainly in Oklahoma and Texas before moving with his family to California for his last year of high school. Although originally an Oklahoma farmer, Webb's father had changed careers and became an evangelical preacher, first moving the family to West Texas. In his autobiography, Webb talked about how he and his younger brother were harassed and beat up walking to and from school to shouts of preacher, preacher. Webb also talked about the difficulties he had in convincing his family that music would be a worthwhile career. High Pockets is a musical mashup, shredding like the Frank Zappa band on the intro and guitar breaks, sounding like an Elton John rocker on the song verses, before relaxing into pure Jimmy Webb on the tender, heartfelt choruses. That's a great description to make me want to listen to this. All right, High Pockets. I don't know who else was singing on there with him. I can't find it anywhere. It, it was a good song. Like, it's basically is, it's, I mean, I envision him. It's it's about him now, you know, talking about being in school and, and just having all these difficulties and basically people bullying you. And 
the course changed up. Well, don't you want to be beautiful? Oh, yes. Don't you want to make money? Someday you're throwing away your future or you're throwing your future away high pockets. That's the first course. Don't you want to be beautiful? Then don't you want to be likable? And then the same. And then go back to don't you want to be beautiful? Why don't you just go home? Future away, future away. Um, so, yeah, just a lot of tough stuff in here if you were ever bullied as a kid. I think most people at some point were bullied as a kid. I know I was um, at times and, and I just started fighting back. But that's a story for another day. But really well done. But, but like Ann Cat Dub said, like this song is all over the place musically, not in a bad way, but it definitely has all kinds of different styles just mashed together. You know, we got the last of our trifecta of Jimmy Webb actually sung songs. We got Met Her on a Plane from 1971. And Cat Dub says it's a gem of a track, a personal favorite of mine. According to Webb, the song was inspired by a psychology article relating that males tended to be more emotional and vulnerable in their conversations on an airplane than they normally would be. I would venture to say psychologically that is because they're a little bit scared or a little bit nervous. They're more willing to talk about things. They didn't have to play it cool because, you know, you get a little bit scared, you open up about things. All right, met her on a plane. Really, it starts as a piano, like for the arrangement, right? But then Jimmy still finds a way to get some interesting sounds in here. And he, he met her on a plane and now he can't get her off of his mind. But he sounded really good on this. Very good vocal performance, right? I met her on a plane. I've forgotten I was made of glass. And so talking about how they're seeing the things going down below them. And, but I kept seeing her and I disappearing in the scenery. I was humming, humming inside. She told him about her pain. She opened up as well. Um, her eyes burned bluer than the skies. It still exists over Nevada. I was humming, humming inside. So he, he made this connection with her. And now he can't get her off of his mind. So really well done. Good, good way to end off our, our trilogy, our three, our three song Jimmy Webb run. But speaking of three songs, we still have three songs left. Next up, we have All I Know from Art Garfunkel in 1973. And Cat Dub says, All I Know was first recorded by Art Garfunkel, appearing on his debut solo album and released as a single, peaking at number nine on the Billboard Hot 100 chart and number one on the Easy Listening chart. It's one of Webb's most beloved compositions. And as performed by Garfunkel, it comes across as a flawless track with lovely flowing lyric lines that almost tumble out like an inspired stream of conscious outbursts. Simply a great moment in popular music. And I did react to one song off of here, Barbara Allen. Uh, so I do have that up from Art, but I've never listened to this album from Art. I like me some Art Garfunkel. I know it's a real hot take, but Art Garfunkel, man, does he got a voice, right? This song supposedly, uh, I found in one place, was written about Rosemary, Rosemary Franklin, who uh, who Jimmy had a relationship with, but didn't work out. And I mean, it's obviously about a relationship that doesn't work out. I bruise you, you bruise me. In other words, like, you know, there's going to be arguments and hurtful things said. We both bruise too easily, too easily to let it show. I love you. And that's all I know. All my plans have fallen through. All my plans depend on you, depend on you to help them grow. I love you. And that's all I know. But the course, but the ending always comes at last. Endings always come too fast, right? They come too fast, but they pass to slow. I love you, and that's all I know. So um, just really well done. And what I really like, too, the nice touch of just dialing everything back in the piano outro at the end because it's a, it's a heartbreaking song, right? And what a great way to just strip everything back out and just have that piano outro. Next up, we have The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Judy Collins, recorded in 1975. I know the name Judy Collins. I don't know if I've ever heard a Judy Collins song, but I'm going to be able to say I have now. And Cat Depp says, first recorded by Joe Cocker and quickly followed by renditions from Judy Collins, Linda Ronstadt, as well as by Webb himself. We can always count on Judy Collins to employ a tasteful classical arrangement with deep emotional power. So this has been my favorite version of the song. The title was taken from a 1966 science fiction novel by Robert A. Heinlein. The moon is a harsh mistress. This does have that classic sound to it. I was... So look, I don't. I was looking at jo Judy Collins' uh, hit songs. Like, I don't think I know any of them. Like, she never had a lot of huge hits. She did cover both sides now from uh, from Joni Mitchell, and also covered a Cohen song that she had some success with in the late '60s. But I just know the name, I guess. But uh, still out here in her '80s doing it, right? I saw she was performing in 2022. So much respect. But this just has that classic sound that 30 years ago I would have hated, right? When I was in my 20s. Now, the older I get, the more I just love stuff like this. I just super appreciate it. And now we're to the last song. And as they say, and now for something completely different, we have Highwaymen from 1984 by the Highwaymen. Probably Webb's most conceptual song, and Cat Dub says, it seems to relate the various incarnations of a man through time, ending with the Highwayman, Highwayman stating, I'll fly a starship across the universe to divide. Precisely the kind of surreal vision that Webb does so well. 
The country music supergroup, The Highwaymen, consisting of Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, and the man in black, Johnny Cash, named themselves after this song. I always wondered how they got that name. And their cover version was the number one hit on the Billboard country chart. I've seen a video of them performing this back when I used to do live streams on Twitch. Now we do them all on YouTube. But I mean, I remember when they came out, you know, I was 12, 13 when this came out. Like, I don't remember the song, um, but, you know, I remember it was a big deal when they came out. A 13-year-old to 12-year-old Sean didn't understand why it was a big deal with these four gentlemen together. I do understand that now. All right. Well, I never talked to you during songs. I was actually talking to you, calling out who was who was where, but I, I always mute my mic so that if I move in my chair, what, so, so just nothing like interrupts the music, right? So uh, you were just seeing me mouth stuff. But I mean, we started with Willie, then we went to Chris, then we went to Waylon, then we finished with Johnny. So uh, it would be hard to find the pecking order in this, right? Obviously, Chris is last. That's nothing against Christopherson. Like, he was a good actor. He's a really good songwriter, too, if you want to dive into that. But he had been last. But the other three, I don't know. But really good story. Like, they thought he was dead and every these things happened. They thought he was dead in every single verse. But he wasn't, man. He's still he's still living, man. He's the highwayman. And uh, just a really well-done song, man. I'm not always a huge fan of country. There's some of it, though. That's a really well-done song. Really good way to end this list off. I got to tell you, going into this thing, I really didn't know anything at all about Jimmy Webb. Like, nothing. So what a fantastic education. I had no idea. He wrote all these songs that these different artists did, right? Just shows you great, great versatility. And you don't see that oftentimes in songwriting. Usually you're kind of a one trick pony. That's not a bad thing, but you write things that fit in this box, right? And only in this box. There's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, but when you can do this and do all these different things, it's pretty amazing. I did a pretty good job because there's actually 12 tracks in this top 10. And, you know, and Cat Dub knows a ton about music and was able to pick like the best tracks. So, you know, all 12 tracks are going to bring it. And they did. Right. So trying to pick faves. I didn't want to have 12. Obviously, I got it down to seven. So that's pretty good for me. Honorable mentions, which way to nowhere from the fifth dimension with Billy Davis on lead vocals, the first song that we actually heard. And then P.F. Sloan by Jimmy Webb himself. Faves are going to be Do What You Got to Do, Nina Simone. Both Glenn Campbell tunes. I know that's not a surprise after you watch this. Wichita Lineman and Galveston, and All I Know by Art Garfunkel, and this last track, Highwaymen by The Highwaymen. Um, so fantastic. So let me know your favorites down below. What other Jimmy Webb penned tunes or sung tunes do I need to check out? Thanks again to Ancat Dub. As always, if you haven't yet, give this a thumbs up. It helps us out and hit that subscribe button. I have over 2,600 videos. Two of those videos are down below. The uh, Fifth Dimension videos that, that NCAT Dub reference at the start. And also remember, there's a bonus playlist down below on Spotify. Just click on that. It'll take you right to that list if you're logged into Spotify. Thanks to NCAT Dub for putting that together. And until next time, guys, I will see you.